This is the story of Swiss International Airlines Flight 850. On the 10th of July 2002, Nimbrer 145 was to fly from Basel Airport in Switzerland to Hamburg in Germany. But due to technical difficulties, the Embraer was out of commission, and they had to use a Saab 2000 instead. On that day, the pilots of Flight 850 went over the METARs and TAFs for northern Germany to get a feel for the weather over Germany that day. They knew that they could expect a few summer storms over Germany, so they added a bit of extra fuel, just in case if they needed to hold for a bit as the weather cleared. Most storms cleared in about 20 or 30 minutes, so even if they did have to hold, it wouldn't be for too long. At 6.09 p.m., the Saab 2000 took off bound for Hamburg. As it approached Hamburg, the weather was bumpy. The Saab 2000 pierced the bad weather. ATC tried its best to keep the plane away from the worst of the weather. By 7.36 p.m., the crew were making a nihilist approach onto runway 23 at Hamburg. But they had to go around as there was some serious turbulence at 3,000 feet, and there was a storm cell right above the runway threshold. At that point, with the amount of fuel that they had, they could loiter around the airport for about 45 minutes, so they decided to do that. They waited to see if the weather would get better. But just as a backup, the pilots inquired about the weather at Bremen. At Bremen, winds were at 9 knots coming in from 320 degrees with 6 kilometers of visibility. It wasn't bad, but the distance between Hamburg and Bremen was punctuated by a line of thunderstorms. At 7.49 p.m., ATC let the pilots know that another plane had landed on runway 33 at Hamburg. But strong winds were still present, so the crew declined the offer to land on runway 33. The crew wanted to try Hanover. They then broke out of the holding pattern and made their way towards Hanover. At 8.13 p.m., the crew were nearing Hanover, but the weather radar painted a dire picture. It was bad. They tuned the ATIS at Tegel to see if the weather there was better. The METAR and the TAF contained the words CAVOC and NOSIG, which meant that the clouds and visibility was okay and there would be no significant change for a while. So bolstered by this information, they proceeded to Tegel. At 8.18 p.m., the low fuel warning came on, and the crew of Flight 850 had only 40 minutes of fuel left. They needed to land soon. The crew asked for priority handling, but the controllers were swamped. But despite that, the controller guided them towards runway 08. The crew said that they were committed to land due to a shortage of fuel. They were getting desperate. But fate had other plans. As the plane raced towards Teagle, the thunderstorms that they had earlier left behind had now reached the airport. The plane was buffeted by heavy turbulence, so the pilots knew that they would not be able to land at Teagle. They needed somewhere else to put their plane down. Somewhere where the weather would not be such a big problem. The controller suggested that the pilots land at Ebersoadle Finno, which was just 27 nautical miles away. The airport, while small, had a long enough runway to accommodate the Saab 2000. The pilots said, we'll take anything at this point. Now the controllers knew that they had an emergency on their hands. Flight 850 was running on fumes, and they needed to get this plane on the ground, somewhere, anywhere. But en route to Finno, the weather radar showed that the airport was engulfed by massive thunderstorms. It was out of the question. The pilots asked if they could try Heringsdorf or New Brandenburg airports. But the plan to divert there was abandoned when they realized that there were storms nearby those airports. They were just flying around Germany looking for an airport to land at. And with each passing second, their situation got more and more serious. The controller got word from another plane that Werneuken Airport had okayish weather. But the thing is that Werneuken did not handle commercial air traffic. It had a long runway, but was mainly used by ultralights and other small aircraft. The controller tried to call the airport, but the controller did not get through. He then called the chairman of the flying club at Werneuken. He said that runway 08 had a mud wall across the runway 
which meant that the pilots would not have the full length of the runway at their disposal. But since the chairman was not at the airfield, he could not give them the weather conditions at the airport. Since the airfield was uncontrolled, the controller that they were talking to gave them as much information as he could about the airport. By 8.40 p.m., the pilots had the runway in sight. The controller said, Okay, uh, we've just been informed that you should use the easterly part of runway, so you are not to land before the threshold of 08. End quote. They were warning them about the mud wall that was across the runway. As soon as the pilots lined up, they were relieved. They had finally found a runway, and not a moment too soon. As the Saab 2000 crossed the threshold, the first officer brought the plane down onto the runway. But then suddenly, the plane went through the mud wall, which was across the runway. This ripped all three of their landing gear off. The plane scraped along the runway, and it came to a stop after sliding about 350 meters or 1,100 feet. In the cockpit, the pilots had a fire warning on engine number two, and they immediately discharged the fire extinguishers in both engines. As the 16 passengers and four crew members made their way away from the wreck of Flight 850, gale force winds and insanely heavy rain engulfed the airport. They had made it, and just in time. On the day of the crash, the weather over Germany was absolutely hellish. A cold front and a warm front converged over Germany, causing thunderstorms and heavy rain in the area. Apparently, the winds were so bad that seven people in the Berlin area were killed. In fact, some points experienced hurricane force winds. Once the pilots flew into that, they were in a tough spot. They were essentially playing a deadly game of cat and mouse with the weather. They tried to land, and the weather would take that airport out. They'd try again, and the story would be the same. So how did the crew get into this position? Well, in the air, the crew did check METARs and other weather reports to understand the conditions at their destination. But for the most part, those reports said that clouds and visibility were okay and that there would be no significant change. For example, Berlin Tegel put out a METAR at 543 saying that visibility was okay and it wouldn't change too much. But at the time that METAR went out, there was a massive storm brewing just 30 nautical miles away. Saying no sick was in fact incorrect. There would have been a lot of change and the pilots were not aware of it. And on top of that, the weather worsened a lot between the weather reports. The investigators then looked at to see how the crew planned for this weather when they were on the ground. They used the Euro significant weather chart and it told them to expect quite a bit of turbulence in the cruise phase, and a lot of turbulence at Hamburg, which is why the crew opted for more fuel. Later on, an hour before departure, SIGMATS, or Significant Meteorological Information, was published by Bremen Airport, but those never reached the crew. So, as they were about to take off, the crew were under the assumption that the weather over Germany consisted of individual thunderstorms. They did not know that all of those individual storms was a part of one massive weather system. Those segments would have helped them identify that, but they never got them. So with that, they were in the air. Once they got to Hamburg, going around was absolutely the right thing to do. The weather was so bad that any landing would have been very dangerous. This is also why they didn't opt for the approach to runway 33. The storm system was still nearby, and even though the conditions were technically in the green for a nihilist approach, the pilots did not want to risk it. They then decided to divert to Hanover. Their plan was to fly parallel to the storm and then get to Hanover before the storm, but it did not work out that way. They then tried Tegel, which was then overwhelmed by the storm, before they could even get to it. They then tried Finno and the No Brandenburg, the storm had really taken them by surprise. At this point, they were zigzagging all over the place. Usually, when you divert, you fly straight to your diversion airport. But unfortunately, their zigzags was burning up valuable fuel, putting the pilots under even more stress. 
It is this that forced their hand to use an airfield that they had no information about. Warnoiken Special Airfield. Now the runway there is long enough to accommodate a Saab 2000. But like I told you before, the runway had this mud wall going right through it. The controller did warn them about the wall by saying that they should land after the threshold but the controller never used any words to actually tell the pilots that the runway was actually blocked. He did not use words like obstacle or blocked or anything like that. These pilots were not familiar with the airport and they were just like, yeah, sure, we'll land at the threshold. Now, usually when you're landing in an airfield that you're not too familiar with, or if you don't have the tower on radio, you would usually do an overflight just to see if the runway was in good condition. But the crew in this case did not have that luxury, as they were really low on fuel. As the plane flew the final approach, the pilot said that the runway was longer than Bremen. He did not notice that the new threshold was further down the runway. This was because the old military markings denoting the old threshold were still there, and they were quite legible. To someone who was not familiar with the airport, this would look like any other runway. But usually, when runways are closed, you paint crosses on them to let pilots know that that section of the runway is closed. But at this airport, the march of time had eroded away the crosses. So as far as the pilots thought, this runway was totally usable. Here are a few pictures that were taken after the crash from a helicopter. You tell me if the display threshold is apparent or not. Making matters worse, the mud wall was low and not very visible until the last moment. To understand why the crew made the decisions that they did, they looked into their history. There was no history of them ever taking part in a CRM course. They did have classes to improve teamwork, but not CRM. This is reflected in their decision making, according to the investigators. Once they were in the holding pattern, they should have just taken a step back and taken stock of their situation. They should have checked to see what all airports were nearby and what the weather was like at each of those airports. Someone that could have held the pilots was the air traffic controller. You see, the pilots were holding very near Lubeck Airport. The controller could have been like, hey, you guys could try landing at Lubeck, but he never did that as the controller was under a lot of pressure due to the weather. Nor did the pilots ask because they were religiously following their prearranged list of diversion airports. Like I said before, had they just taken a moment, they would have realized that Lubeck was a suitable option. This accident comes down to just bad timing. When they took off, the weather was good. And as it got worse, they failed to identify that the storms that they were seeing were not isolated ones, but that they were a part of a much larger system. The lack of this knowledge meant that they wasted valuable time and fuel going from airport to airport. No one thought to tell them about the nearby airports when they were within a safe distance of one. All of this is made worse by the fact that the markings at Warnoiken had been worn away, meaning that the pilots had no way of knowing that the runway that they were landing on had a wall going right through it. So, what do you think? Do you think that this could have ended worse than it already did? If so, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.